so so far we've talked about molecular genetics or what's really happening at the allele level but it's important to understand many developmental psychologists are not working in wet labs we're not looking under the microscope and instead when we talk about genetics we're actually referring to behavioral genetics and so behavioral genetics is important in reality things are not as simple as punning crosses and one allele for all traits in fact most psychological traits are what we refer to as polygenic traits Polygenic means that there's more than one set of alleles that codes for them. In fact, we know that things like eye color are coded on at least 13 different alleles. So when it comes to things like criminal behavior, personality, autism, depression, or intelligence, although we've tried to locate where these are mapped in our genome, it's really tricky and our science just isn't there yet. So instead, we had to track and see how these behavioral characteristics are mapped through families. And this can be a bit tricky because in actuality, our family tends to supply both the nature, our genetics, and the nurture, our environment. So how can we really track what's genetic? Well, first off, we have to acknowledge the gene environment correlations, the fact that there are massive overlaps here. We might want to say, oh, if a child's smart, it's because their parents were smart and they inherited their genetics but they also inherited the environment that the parents gave them, like if they had books in the home or if they had lots of reading materials around. So both of those things might influence them. And we actually find those two things are linked. The parents' genetics and the environment that the parents provide are also highly correlated. That is, smarter parents tend to have more books in their house. Or parents who are more musically inclined at a genetic level play more music in the home. So because of this, we have to acknowledge how our genes and our environment go together. And we'd like to talk about this in three different ways, passive, reactive, and active gene environment correlations. By passive, what we mean is that the genetics a child inherits associate and match the environment their parents provide. So for example, let's say a child is born with the genetics that they're just really athletic and they like to go around kicking soccer balls and they just happen to be born into a family that is always out on the weekend playing soccer in the local park. That is a passive gene environment correlation. Sometimes we don't have that type of correlation, but we experience a reactive gene environment correlation. And this is when a child's genetics don't necessarily match the environment the parents provide, but the child can make that environment through getting the parents to respond to them. This is the idea that parents that are not super active might have a kid who's very active. And that kid being so active influences the parents to become more active. So once the parents realize, oh, this kid's always running around the house and they have to keep up with them and they just always have energy they have to burn off, even as a toddler, the parents may say, let's take them to the park. And the parents would otherwise just kind of sit home and be couch potatoes, but because that child is so active, they're gonna go to the park. Or we might actually have the third type, which is known as active. This is when the parents who are pretty lazy couch potatoes have a really active kid and the kid can't really get that reaction out of their parents. So instead, the kid goes and finds that environment for themselves. This is the idea that as a young child, the parents are not going to become active. So the child takes off and goes in the backyard and plays. Or when the child gets older, they're going to leave and go to the park by themselves. The parents have nothing to do with it. The child is actively finding an environment that matches their genotypic expression. And we can see this with lots of characteristics. We could see this with an extroverted family. Perhaps the extroverted child grew up in an extroverted family and there was lots to do and lots of parties. Or perhaps the extroverted child has introverted parents, but they can ask them, hey, can I have a play date? Hey, can this person come over? And they can get that reaction in their parents. Or perhaps the extroverted child can't get that reaction in their parents and they are constantly going over to their friends' houses and staying out late as a teenager to find that environment. Or maybe we have a really hostile, argumentative child who was born into a really debateful, argumentative family who liked to yell over the supper table and have very passionate discussions. That would be a passive a gene environment correlation. Or perhaps this argumentative child is born to really tender-hearted parents who don't argue, but because the child is so argumentative, they make the parents become argumentative through always giving them a struggle. Or perhaps that argumentative child can't elicit that in their parents, so instead they go to school and they get in trouble at school or they join the debate club or they find an active gene environment correlation. It's important to understand no matter what's going on here, it becomes very difficult to tease apart 
the nature versus nurture, and what our parents provide in terms of DNA and what they provide in terms of environment. It also gets complicated because in addition to the gene environment correlation, we also know about the gene environment interaction. And so the gene environment interaction is the idea that sometimes our genes, even at the molecular gene level, don't express unless there's certain environments. So two examples. We know that there is at the allele level an MAOA gene that is greatly associated with aggression and family violence. And we know that if that's inherited, that can really increase the prevalence a person will be aggressive as an adult. However, studies have found that the MAOA gene doesn't tend to be linked to aggression if a child grows up in a safe home environment. So it only tends to be expressed if you have both. If you grow up in a very violent environment and you have the, the gene. So what often happens here is you, we see this interaction. So it's different combinations of both your genetics and the environment. How about another example? We just talked about PKU. And if a person with PKU follows a very strict diet and doesn't eat things with the very specific amino acids that they can't process, then they'll grow up and have a typically developed life. Versus if they eat those amino acids, they will experience brain damage and intellectual disability. Compare that to someone without PKU, it doesn't really matter if they follow a specific diet or not, they're not going to have those outcomes. And so it's the different combinations of the genes in the environment that can lead to these different phenotypic expressions of brain damage or not brain damage. So moving away from these very allele-based genetics, let's even talk about bigger, broader things. We're talking about polygenic traits, like let's talk about engagement in a classroom. We know that some kids have uh, this genetic temperamental characteristic known as high anxiety at school. And kids who are really highly anxious in the classroom may not want to participate or engage or talk or volunteer as much. And we know that other kids that are less anxious may participate more. But we also find this flips depending on what type of classroom they're in. So let's think of these possibilities in the classroom. Let's think about a really negative classroom where things are really hostile and people are not so supportive and not very friendly and they're very judgmental. And let's think about a really positive classroom where you feel safe, where people are encouraging and you know you're not going to be belittled and you understand what's going to come next and you understand the process. What we find is those kids that are not so anxious, they're pretty resilient. They're going to do what they're going to do regardless if it's a negative classroom or if it's a positive classroom versus those kids that are really anxious in that negative classroom they're going to coil up and disengage even more they're going to hide away but in that positive classroom they're going to actually increase and actually participate more than they otherwise would have they might not participate more than the other kids and that's not what this graph is showing it's showing the rate of change they experience and what is actually occurring here is they benefit from a positive classroom more than the other kids do. And they also suffer from a negative classroom more than the other kids do. So this is a gene environment interaction because this genetic expression and how it navigates the environment can be very different. So now that we've talked about gene environment correlations and gene environment interactions, now we can actually talk about how do we tease this apart? It's so complicated. And this is where we tease apart the familial versus genetic traits. There's lots of traits that are passed down just because they're familial and they're not genetic at all. We know things like obesity may not always have a genetic tie, but because families eat together and they ingrain those habits, it can be passed down in a familial sense. And things like migraines can also be familial. There's not a genetic component, but it's a stress and coping technique that's passed down through families. So how do we tease this apart? Well, we have to look at the different correlations. One such way is we might compare how strong bio kids and their bio parents are correlated and bio kids and their adopted parents are correlated. And that can help us to understand which components are more about the environment and which are more about the genes. We can also look and compare how similar bio siblings, half siblings, and step siblings are to each other and might find that if the bio siblings are more similar to each other, we can actually measure, and there's actually statistical formulas for this, to determine how much of the similarity is due to genetics versus due to environment. Similarly, we can also do this not through comparing bio half and step siblings, but rather through comparing identical and fraternal twins and seeing if the similarity between identical twins is higher than the similarity between fraternal twins and how much we can calculate.
Now it's important for us to understand what we mean by talking about identical versus fraternal twins. So if you're not familiar, identical twins are scientifically known as monozygotic twins. Monozygotic or identical twins are such because they're formed from one original zygote. A zygote is the term used to explain when a sperm and an egg uh, meet in fertilization. So it turns into one zygote and the zygote is splitting into multiple cells. And what happens here in monozygotic twins is as the cell is splitting, it splits and then there's just a little bit of amniotic fluid that gets in the way and it pushes the clusters of cells apart. And then those two clusters of cells both turn into embryos and those two embryos hold the same DNA and therefore they're going to develop as identical. Then we have the dizygotic twins. And di just means two, and we're talking about two zygotes. So dizygotic twins come from two separate zygotes. For many different reasons, two eggs were released and two different sperm fertilized those two different eggs. So the eggs have different DNA, the sperm have different DNA, and in the process, we're gonna have two zygotes form, and those two zygotes are gonna form into two genetically different individuals. So if you have twins where their genders are different or they look very different in appearance, they are going to be fraternal twins or dizygotic twins. And if you have twins with the exact same DNA, those are identical twins or monozygotic twins. And so testing the differences between these twins, because they grow in the womb at the same time, they share the same prenatal environment, they grew up in the same house, they grew up at the same time in history, and so their environment is going to be very similar but the monozygotic twins are more similar in DNA than the dizygotic twins are. And this can really help us to tell the difference between how much of a trait or how much of a behavior is due to genetics alone and how much of it is due to shared experiences and shared environment.